Beast Watch News, watching the rising beast of Revelation. Was President Trump's recognition of Israeli sovereignty over Golan just a grand gesture of friendship between the U.S. and Israel? Or is there more to this story? Who stands to benefit and who loses? What are those benefits? Who does the Golan Heights belong to anyway? The Bible tells us. Is this part of Yahweh's plan? These and other questions answered, plus Russian, Arab, and European reaction on today's Jerusalem report. While President Donald Trump's decision to recognize Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights is primarily being explained away as geopolitics, it may have more to do with U.S. domestic politics. Trump may be trying to cause a shift in partisan support of Israel, away from the Democrats to the Republican Party, which will also rally evangelical Christians around his presidency. He chose to sign the goal on height sovereignty decree on March 25th as American Israel Public Affairs Committee, the APAC, the main Israel lobby group in the United States, was holding its annual conference in Washington. This year, the event took place against the backdrop of Democratic House Representative Ilan Omar's comments criticizing the lobby and the decision of a number of Democratic presidential candidates to boycott it. Trump and members of his administration took the opportunity to attack the Democratic Party, with Vice President Mike Pence rebuking the Democratic Party for being afraid to stand with the strongest supporters of Israel in America. A few days earlier, Trump was even more explicit. I don't know what happened to them, he said, but they are totally anti-Israel. Frankly, I think they are anti-Jewish. The White House is purposefully feeding a narrative that the Democrats' commitment to Israel is wavering and that there are growing signs of what one former Trump campaign aide has called Jexodus, the supposed exodus of American Jews from the Democratic camp, which they have traditionally supported, to the Republican one. But despite Trump's seemingly encouraging a Jexodus, it is not the Jewish vote he is after. Jews are only 2-3% to of the American electorate. Rather, his goal is to secure the support of, and a high turnout in, the 2020 presidential election among evangelical Christians, who make up 25% of the U.S. population. There has always been a complex political symmetry between Israeli and U.S. politics. Right-wing Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu never got along with two liberal U.S. presidents, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. However, Trump is the gift that keeps on giving. The current collusion between the right-wing leaders in both the U.S. and Israel is unprecedented and is marginalizing the left in both countries and pushing back against what they perceive as liberal institutions, most notably the media and the judiciary branch. Trump hopes to use this alliance to engineer a sway to the right in U.S. politics, similar to the one in Israel. While political decisions favoring Israel are certainly boosting Trump's and Netanyahu's chances of re-election, they are conflicting with other U.S. objectives in the Middle East. Pompeo's March 22nd visit to Beirut, for example, was eclipsed by Trump's decision on the Golan Heights, which undermined his call on local political forces to deter Hezbollah. Jewish and pro-Israel groups applauded Trump's declaration. But what appears to be good, i.e. the moving of the U.S. Embassy to Israel and quitting the Iran nuclear deal was only the start of Trump's agenda to change the world by involving the leader of Israel's sister, the United States and her Western allies, in a push for Israel to become a supreme power on the earth. I suspect 
Trump's unconscious maneuverings also have to do with the tribe of Reuben. If Trump is a descendant of Reuben, his manipulations are intended to boost Trump's ego, which likely wants to rule over Israel. I suspect Trump's motivation, unconscious as it likely is, really has to do with Reuben's DNA trying to regain its supremacy as firstborn of Israel. According to the New York Times, President Trump's proposed reversal of decades of American policy on the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights has more to do with Israeli politics than American interests. Trump created a controversy where none needed to exist, this article says. Israel has been under no pressure to end the occupation of Golan, which began during the 1967 Arab-Israeli War with the seizure of some 400 square miles by Israeli troops. Trump's politics are for both reasons given in the Al Jazeera article and in the New York Times. Trump has both agendas in mind, in my opinion. Plus, Yahweh may be using Trump to facilitate the reuniting of the House of Israel, led by the U.S. in the Western world, and the House of Judah, who are the Jews of the modern U.N.-created political state of Israel. Of course, both houses must go through a horrible war together before they reunite. Trump's policies are making a mess for America and Israel, making the prospects of war much more real and closer to coming. But Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing a tough re-election fight, and he has pleaded with Mr. Trump to make the move. The tweet bolsters his claim that he can best keep Israel safe because of his close ties to the White House. There is another possible truth that lies halfway between the Al Jazeera and the New York Times opinions. It is also likely that Trump doesn't want to face Benny Gantz as Israel's prime minister. Therefore, Trump needs to boost Netanyahu for the Israeli election and for the peace plan to be revealed after the election. Thus, Trump helped Israelis to see that Netanyahu is the best choice in the election by letting them think that he got Trump to do his bidding. Gantz is unlikely to get behind a peace plan he has not had a chance to shape, as Netanyahu had for the past two plus years. This is another reason that Trump might not want Gantz in office. The U.S. will need to consult Gantz, who might not take office until late spring, according to Politico, and this would hold up the deal of the century. Trump would probably rather see Gantz in the defense minister post to uphold the deal once it is made, if it is made. Naftali Bennett said that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and U.S. President Donald Trump were planning to establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank and divide Jerusalem, according to the Times of Israel, on February 24, 2019. Of course... Netanyahu sniffed at Bennett's statement. The U.S. and Israeli officials told McClatchy they did not expect Trump to raise the administration's proposals for peace with the Palestinians, largely complete now, but not yet revealed to the public nor privately shared with Netanyahu in Monday's meeting at the White House nor any other time before Israel's general elections on April 9th. President Donald Trump gave Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu not one, but two political gifts this week, according to McClatchy, recognition of Israeli control over the Golan Heights and a delay in the rollout of his administration's long-awaited Middle East peace plan. Releasing the plan in advance of April 9th would require Netanyahu to go on record with policy positions sure to divide his delicate political coalition, but in exchange for holding out on its publication until after the vote, administration officials expect Netanyahu to play ball 
if he wins. We have an expectation that they will fully engage and take a look at it. A U.S. official told McClatchy, acknowledging the plan requires politically challenging concessions from both parties. It'll be obvious to both sides where the compromises need to be made. It'll be spelled out in the plan. In other words, the things Trump has done for Israel and Netanyahu, like this Golan recognition and moving the U.S. Embassy, have a price. That unnamed U.S. official must know something that the rest of the world does not. Netanyahu is ready to make the deal in exchange for all the favors Trump has given him. The U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, the Golan Heights Declaration, rescinding the Iran nuclear deal and a permanent U.S. military base on Israeli soil to guard Israel from Iran and Russia, even though this was necessary due to Trump's ineptness dealing with President Vladimir Putin on Iranian and Syrian issues. The prophetic value of Golan is this. Golan was Manasseh's territory, according to Deuteronomy 4:43, Joshua 20, verse 8, and 21, verse 27, and 1 Chronicles 6, 71. Manasseh is Ephraim's older brother and the father of the half-tribe of the same name. Jacob's blessing was for Ephraim to hold the firstborn position temporarily for his father Joseph. Manasseh is an Ephraimite, a house of Israelite, and one who today provides a unique opportunity for an older brother such as a Reubenite to gain back his firstborn status by orchestrating control over the area, then giving that same control to the Jews of the modern UN-created political state of Israel. I'm talking here about a possible Trump unconscious and underhanded motivation. Netanyahu praised Trump for this gift of Golan. He said, over the years, Israel has been blessed to have many friends who sat in the Oval Office, but Israel has never had a better friend than you. You showed this time and again. You showed this when you withdrew from the disastrous nuclear deal with Iran. You said it. You did it. You showed it again when you restored sanctions against a genocidal regime that seeks to destroy the one and only Jewish state. You said it, and you did it. You showed that when you recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moved the American embassy there. You said it. You did it. And you have shown it once again today, Mr. President, with your official proclamation recognizing Israel's sovereignty on the Golan Heights. In a powerful detour from political platitudes, the Israeli Prime Minister waxed biblical, comparing the American president to Persian King Cyrus. King Cyrus could not have cared less about Golan, but that's for another time. The Golan Declaration is not just about politics, though. It is also about oil. Ezekiel 38, 11, and 12 says about Gog, And you shall say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to take your hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. The timing of the declaration is significant. This is another crude, no pun intended, attempt by Trump to meddle in Israel's election that will provide Netanyahu with a massive bump as he struggles against corruption indictments and a credible threat from the rival party, Blue and White, headed by former army generals. 
Netanyahu could barely contain his glee after Trump's tweet, reportedly calling to tell him, You made history. But in truth, this was no caprice. Israel and Washington have been heading in this direction for a while. Michael Oren, a former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. and a confidant of Netanyahu's, formally launched a plan last year to quadruple the size of the Golan settler population to 100,000 within a decade. The U.S. State Department offered its apparent seal of approval last month when it included the Golan Heights for the first time in the Israel section of its annual Human Rights Report. This month, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham made a very public tour of the Golan in an Israeli military helicopter alongside Netanyahu and David Friedman. Whatever Netanyahu's spin about the need to avert an Iranian threat, Israel has other, more concrete reasons for holding on to the Golan. The territory is rich in water sources and provides Israel with decisive control over the Sea of Galilee, that large freshwater lake that is crucially important in a region facing ever greater water shortages. And Israel has been quietly cooperating with U.S. energy giant Genie to explore potentially large oil reserves under the Golan. Trump's advisor and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, has family interests in Genie. But extracting the oil will be difficult unless Israel can plausibly rather argue that it has sovereignty over the territory. According to RT.com, perhaps even more pivotal is the lucrative matter of giant oil reserves reckoned to be under the Golan rocks as reported previously by Whitney Webb. U.S. oil company Genie, through its Israeli subsidiary, was given exclusive exploration rights to drill the occupied territory by the Netanyahu government in April of 2013. Two years later, a major oil discovery was made. But whatever Trump says, the decision will not bring security for Israel or regional stability. In fact, it makes a nonsense of Trump's deal of the century, a long-delayed regional peace plan to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that, according to rumor, may be unveiled soon after the Israeli election. Instead, U.S. recognition will prove a boon for the Israeli right, which has been clamoring to annex vast areas of the West Bank and thereby drive a final nail into the coffin of the two-state solution. Israel's right can now plausibly argue, if Trump has consented to our illegal seizure of the Golan, why not also our theft of the West Bank? Well, let me tell you. It does not necessarily follow that annexation of part or all of the West Bank puts an end to the two-state solution. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Nor does recognition of Golan belonging to Israel constitute a theft. Golan belongs to the tribes. Just because the House of Judah Jews refused to allow us back onto our land doesn't mean Golan should not become part of the modern UN-created political state of Israel. In fact, I believe this is another piece of Yahweh's will. Once the modern UN-created political state of Israel has full control of all the land, Yahweh will have even more reason to hold them accountable to that jubilee oath they took last year and the year before. The Economist magazine headlined in November 2015 saying, Black Gold Under the Golan, Just One Catch. The business magazine reported how U.S. and Israeli oil experts had found a bonanza, but in a most inconvenient site inconvenienced, that is, by international law, not recognizing Israeli territorial claims. Another driving force is the close connections between Trump's inner circle and the Genie Energy Company. Get that. Trump's inner circle and the Genie 
Energy Company. If you don't think that this isn't about oil, think again. The former president of the company is Ira Greenstein, a lawyer who is close to the Kushner family through mutual business interests. Greenstein was brought into the White House advisory circle as a legal aide, reportedly through his connections to Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law. Observers have noted that revolving door relations is a stark and potentially illegal conflict of interest in the White House. The cozy overlap of connections include Jerry Cohn, a former chief executive at Wall Street Bank Goldman Sachs and who, until last year, served as Trump's economic advisor. Goldman Sachs was reportedly a major investor in Genie Energy. Trump's special representative for international negotiations, Jason Greenblatt, is also reportedly another major investor in Genie. You're not being told the entire truth by the mainstream media. Just like you're not being told the entire truth about the coming Jewish Kabod Cabal Messiah Antichrist, you're not being told the reasons for Trump's and Netanyahu's collusions on matters of Golan and the peace deal either. There is a great deal of money to be made, a way for the U.S. to continue having a stake in the Middle East soil and gas production, not to mention the strategic ability to oppose Iran. And of course, there is the agenda of Trump to get his name in the history books as the world's greatest deal maker using the peace plan to do so, along with helping Israel unveil its man Messiah. All of this may have you confused. You're not alone. First, Kushner talks about defining borders in the coming peace deal. Then, Trump paves the way for the Israelis to annex all of the West Bank via the Golan recognition, which lines Trump's and his friends' pockets. That appears to do away with a two-state deal. Here is what the Times of Israel has to say. Kushner's most dangerous and recent talk was about establishing borders. He did not mention the two-state solution. He did not refer to the Palestinians' right to self-determination in building a livable, sovereign, and independent state. The man said the goal of establishing borders is removing them. That cannot be interpreted in any other way than a proposal to create a Palestinian entity that is less than a state and more than an autonomously ruled area. That is the same way that Netanyahu and the Israeli right-wing leaders define a two-state solution. Allowing the Israelis to have security control in Palestinian areas of the West Bank seems to be part of the coming peace deal. Addressing a convention of the pro-Israel lobby group APAC in Washington, David Friedman asked, can we leave this peace deal to an administration that may not understand the ex existential risk to Israel if Judea and Samaria are overcome by terrorists in the manner that befell the Gaza Strip after the IDF withdrew from this territory? Friedman uses the biblical terms for the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, when referring to the 2005 pullout of Israeli troops and settlers from Gaza, according to this Reuters article. Well, Friedman may be using biblical terminology, but he lacks understanding of what he is saying. Judea belonged to the tribe of Judah. Samaria belonged to the tribe of Ephraim. The tribe of Judah, along with the Levites, the tribes of Benjamin and Simeon, and a few from the northern territory, became known as Jews. And by the way, the word Jew is a Babylonian diminutive derogatory term. Samaria became a city of the Jews after the Assyrians took the house of Israel captive. 
Some tribes and parts of tribes remained in Israel and were moved to the mountains by the Assyrians. However, the Jews began moving to the same mountains. Today, the Israelite people who still live there after 2,700 years are a mixture of people from the house of Israel and the house of Judah, along with some Edomites and Arabs, but mostly Israelites. Samaria never belonged to the house of Judah, and it never will. Ephraim will get his territory back when Yeshua returns to set many issues straight. Friedman's comments did not say what overriding Israeli security control in the West Bank would entail, but his reference to a permanent defense post in its eastern sector bordering Jordan seemed to suggest at least a partial troop presence. Might I suggest that U.S. troops will help with Israel's security in the West Bank? We will have to wait and see, of course, but I think this is a possibility, and if I am right, this will be another element that fulfills Ezekiel 38 and 39. And now, how do you suppose this Golan recognition is affecting Russia? You know, Washington condemned Russia for annexing Crimea five years ago. How is Russia taking this news? Do you suppose Russia and Iran are okay with this annexation? Well, Moscow warned on Monday against a new wave of tensions in the Middle East following the decision by Washington to recognize Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said the move ignores all international procedures and would only aggravate the situation. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov told U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo that the U.S. decision leads to a gross violation of international law, blocks the resolution of the Syrian crisis, and aggravates the situation in all the Middle East. The announcement angered the Arab world, including Syria, which vowed to recover the Golan Heights in the wake of Trump's declaration saying the Golan would remain Syrian and Arab, and adding that Trump had shown contempt for international law. Also criticizing the move was Turkey, with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan vowing on Sunday he will take the issue of the Golan Heights to the United Nations. Israel is the only nation to whom Golan belongs, but it belongs to the entire nation, not just the Jews. All this manipulation and political maneuvering is leading up to the House of Judah and the House of Israel's comeuppance. Trump, if he is a descendant from the tribe of Reuben, has no more right to that territory than the Jews. He doesn't have the right to turn it over to anyone but the tribe of Manasseh. Now let's take a look at the Arabs' thoughts. The Trump-Netanyahu alliance is putting Arab allies of Washington in a difficult position, as unconditional U.S. gifts to Israel are increasingly antagonizing the Arab public. These policy distractions undertaken by the Trump administration are undermining the U.S.'s attempt to deter Iran and are, in many ways, helping Tehran's anti-U.S. narrative. The growing alliance between the U.S. evangelicals and the Israeli right is polarizing the U.S. and Middle East politics, and while it may secure short-term electoral gains for Trump and Netanyahu, in the long term it may prove disastrous. The pursuit of policies motivated by biblical interpretations risks not only derailing U.S. foreign policy, just like it did under the Bush administration, but also alienating some Republican voters, especially millennials. Well, 
I have only one comment to this last paragraph. Prophetic events are designed to derail the politics and policies of men. President Trump continues shaking alliances across the globe with his Jerusalem and Israel-centric policies. Some have appeared to be good and others evil. But His Majesty King Abdullah warned on Wednesday during a visit to the Zarqa government that Jerusalem is a red line and that the Jordanian people stand behind him on this issue. Many believe Jordan will turn against Israel in the end of days and perhaps Trump's continued pushing of the red line will be the reason. Jordan would rather see a peaceful solution to the issue of Jerusalem and not to blindly follow the camp of U.S. President Donald Trump, who seems to be focused on appeasing the Jewish lobby in the U.S. and to please his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, whose questionable ties, according to this article, to Israel should be a good reason to remove him from his post as presidential advisor in charge of broken a Mideast peace deal, which will certainly be at the expense of justice and Arab rights. So says this Jordan Times article, the nepotism of Trump that is affecting his Mideast decisions, including his most recent decision on Monday recognizing Syria's Golan Heights, occupied by Israel in the 1967 Arab-Israeli war as part of Israel, should not be copied by other countries of the world. If Trump and Kushner love Israel so much, this article says they can donate U.S. land to them, but not Palestinian and Syrian land. Any country in the world that also supports Israel so much can do the same by giving it part of their national land, not Palestinian or Syrian land. Jordan's stand on Jerusalem should be emulated by other Arab countries which are scheduled to convene for the annual Arab summit in Tunisia next week. Arab leaders should rise to the occasion and work to translate the will of their peoples on the holy city of Jerusalem, on the suffering of the Palestinian people, and on the Golan Heights. These people will judge their leaders harshly, as they will judge other countries that are doing them and their causes injustices. The world as a whole should still have faith that a just peace is the only answer to all of the Middle East problems, not one-sided unilateral measures. Well, I guess you figured out that King Abdullah is not happy. Saudi Arabia denounced U.S. President Donald Trump's recognition of Israel's 1981 annexation of the Golan Heights in a statement released by the Saudi press agency on Tuesday. Attempts to impose fait accompli do not change the facts, the statement said. It said the Golan Heights was an occupied Syrian Arab land in accordance with the relevant international resolutions. It will have significant negative effects on the peace process in the Middle East and the security and stability of the region, it said. In contrast to the Saudi claims, Netanyahu called the Golan a historic part of the Jewish people's heritage. When you put a shovel in the ground, you uncover magnificent synagogues that we are restoring there, he stated. The Golan is ours by historic right. The Golan is ours by the right of self-defense, and President Trump has recognized this. Well, I reiterate that these people are all fighting over land that Yahweh never said belonged to them. Golan is being used as a strategic element in many people's political agendas, beginning with Donald Trump. The Arab League also condemned Trump's declaration, bringing into question the latest Arab turn toward Israel as an ally against Iran. 
The Druze population of Golan rejected Trump's announcement. Trump can make his statements and say he wants to make the Golan part of Israel, but we know this will stay Syrian land, said 70-year-old Sheikh Mahmoud Nazir. France also does not like Trump's move. On Wednesday, the European states voted against Golan as part of Israel, saying Trump's recognition violates international law. Because of Trump's move, there has been a new U.S. military buildup in the Middle East. Debka reports that the U.S. has substantially boosted its military strength in both countries and distributed the strength among six bases in Iraq and Syria. In fact, the recent U.S. buildup, which came after Trump declared a U.S. pullout from the Middle East, seems to have been done because of his plan for Golan. The new U.S. military deployment in Syria and Iraq gives substance to President Trump's statement that the time has come to recognize Israeli sovereignty over the Golan. Most significantly, it is a high impediment for the plan hatched between Tehran and the Assad regime to move forward without delay for the establishment of an Iranian land bridge to the Mediterranean after first reopening the Iraqi-Syrian border. Iranian, Syrian, and Iraqi generals began planning this project when they met on March 18th in Damascus. Is the Golan recognition another key to Trump's re-election? The Golan recognition is just one of several incidents that I've told you about that will cement the evangelical vote on Trump's side. This move was not just for helping Netanyahu, but also for helping Trump in the 2020 election. Recent weeks have seen a change in the politics of America where the Democrats now have spoiled and foul-smelling egg all over their faces because Trump has been cleared of all charges in the Russia election scandal, but the twist is that Hillary Clinton is once again on the hot seat. Trump's Jerusalem embassy move, the Golan recognition, rescinding the Iran nuclear deal along with the appearance, and it is appearance only, of the good U.S. economy are sure to win him the next election if things continue to go his way. And if Jared Kushner is able to snag the peace deal, well, the election most certainly will be clinched. But now we're going to talk about Hamas. The uptick in Hamas attacks may have something to do with Kushner's peace deal. Perhaps even making the after peace deal signing seem like such a great achievement. It is possible that the West Bank will receive a special status in Israel, not as its own state, as I've said, but as its own entity, as stated earlier. This would be akin to turning the areas occupied by Palestinians into the equivalent of Native American reservations. We all know about the inequalities provided by the U.S. government against the Native American population living on reservations. Even when Native Americans move away from reservations, they are discriminated against. In return for this special status, it could be that Kushner's deal with Hamas will be such that Gaza becomes its own state, with Hamas in control, as I reported a couple of weeks ago, in exchange for no more missiles or any other aggression from the Palestinians in Gaza. In fact, I have wondered if the recent uptick in Hamas missile aggression might be in anticipation of the day when they must lay down all their military aggression. Such a move on the part of Kushner would make the deal seem like the ultimate peacemaking treaty yet presented to the Palestinians and Israelis. If only Hamas would stick to the plan, 
But you know what the Bible says, right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The coming of peace is anybody's guess, including mine. Everyone wants to know, not only because it has been a long and drawn-out affair, but because some are anxious to make history. Some just want there to be peace in the Middle East, and others, like me, just want to move forward with getting to Yeshua's kingdom. And now, Hillary Clinton is in the crosshairs. Senate Republicans broadly satisfied that Attorney General Bill Barr's readout of conclusions from the Mueller report has vindicated President Donald Trump are now eager to go on the offensive and launch a few investigations of their own. Senate Judiciary Chair Lindsey Graham has proposed appointing another special counsel in order to review why the FBI made certain decisions such as its use of a FISA warrant to surveil Trump campaign aide Carter Page. In addition to examining the way the FBI acted toward the Trump campaign in 2016, Republicans indicated that they have questions on a whole slate of matters centering on why the special counsel probe into potential collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia began in the first place. They also blocked a move from Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer to call for Mueller's report to be made public, a similar resolution passed with bipartisan support in the House last week. Rather than simply accepting the results of the Mueller report and moving on to other legislative priorities, Republicans seem determined to capitalize on this momentum to call out what they see as potentially unfair treatment toward the Trump campaign and administration. Now that the so-called cloud has been lifted from Trump, they're eager to reclaim some of this attention for their own political purposes. In short, they're ready for some payback. Graham offered up a laundry list of questions he's interested in examining, including how the FBI reviewed Clinton's emails, the impact of potential anti-Trump sentiment in the agency, and the broader role the FBI and DOJ may have played in harming Trump's electoral chances. Many of Graham's outstanding queries appeared tied to how then-FBI Director James Comey handled the probe of Hillary Clinton's private email server, as well as the role that a dossier from former British spy Christopher Steele played in the agency's scrutiny of the Trump campaign. This dossier contained information alleging a conspiracy between Trump and the Russian government. Under the assumption that Trump has effectively been cleared by the Mueller report, Graham is pushing for the same scrutiny to be applied to the way law enforcement agencies treated the Clinton campaign. Republicans surely know that while this has an appearance of fairness, it has the added benefit of putting Hillary Clinton and emails back in the news. As part of their apparent victory lap, it's clear they simply want Democrats to feel the pressure. Fox News Channel's Mark Levin, a best-selling author whose daily broadcast is heard by more than 10 million listeners on nearly 400 stations and who also hosts Fox News Life, Liberty, and Levin, delivered the charge during Hannity on Monday night just one day after Attorney General William Barr released a summary of Mueller's findings showing there was no evidence Trump or anyone close to him colluded with Russia to steal the 2016 election. Hillary Clinton, she's been silent for three or four days, hasn't she? Barack Obama's been silent throughout all this, hasn't he, Levin said. For all the talk of the Democrats who run these committees, they don't want to talk to Hillary Clinton. They don't want to talk to Barack Obama. Levin then turned his attention to the Democratic Party, accusing it of being 
anti-American. We have a big problem in this country, he said. The Democratic Party is not a pro-American party. They lost an election. They want to destroy the president and the presidency. Listen to their candidates. Anti-American, anti-capitalism, anti-liberty, anti-security, anti-immigration. This is the problem, and the media is the mouthpiece. That's it for this Beast Watch News update. This is Kimberly Rogers Brown signing off. Click over to BeastWatchNews.com for full comprehensive coverage of all the headlines fulfilling end of days Bible prophecy.